Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, thank you for coming to this session on the Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road Initiative was started, was mentioned by President Xi Jinping of China in 2013 while he was visiting Kazakhstan. The he was talking <clears throat> about the terrestrial belt, and then the next year in Indonesia, I believe it was, he mentioned the sea route or the sea road. It used to be called the one Belt One Road, and later they call Belt and Road Initiative or BRI. <clears throat> a lot of people are not so clear about the terms, especially in English, because I believe that was a mistake made by the Chinese in translation. Mm -hmm. And that is, the belt is a terrestrial belt that spans all the way from East Asia, from Japan, Korea, China, all the way to the eastern part of East uh, Europe. The road in the Chinese language can be sea road, but of course, in the English language, you don't have a road in the sea. So perhaps we should call it the sea route, but doesn't matter. The road is a sea link. And this is my <coughs> first point. The second point is that this is nothing new. 2,000 years ago, mankind already had the Silk Road. What we are talking about today, basically geographically, is exactly the same area that was there 2,000 years ago. And President Xi Jinping mentioned in, the old day, uh, in 2013 that this is the Silk Road. So I suppose it's nothing new under the sun, and this is just another effort of mankind <coughs> over a long period of time. This thing was mentioned by China, was brought up by China, but from day one, President Xi Jinping mentioned that this is not something for China alone. This is way too big for any one country. <coughs> this is something that is indeed for the international community. China, wealthy as it may be, does not have all the necessary funding for such a huge endeavor. It is really an endeavor that crosses 50, 60 countries, indeed not just the countries that is touched along the Silk Road today given transportation and technology and communication, anyone can participate in this effort. And hence, for example, the AIIB, the Asia Investment <coughs> Infrastructure Investment Bank, Yes, started by China, <clears throat> but do you know that today some of the top executives are American, European, the rest of, East A uh, rest of Asians. And this is something that is truly an effort that needs the international community to participate. Where I think that it has went wrong, if it did go wrong, was that I believe that the populace in particular, in particular on the internet, had just blown this thing way out of proportion. And then, of course, foreign countries, some of them who don't like either China or Xi Jinping, want to make it into a grand strategy. Well, if it is a grand strategy, as far as I can tell, as an economic strategy, as we will show later, geopolitically, it really does not make sense, but geoeconomically, it makes all the sense. Let's confront this head on. That is, why is China bringing this up? What is there for China? Well, as I said, it is for everybody who want to participate. And by the way, everybody sign up on AIIB, all the major nations except two. <coughs> that is United States and Japan. I hope they will join very soon. Obviously, there is something for China. Nobody in the international arena does everything, does things because of altruism. It must be for its own good. In the short run, this is very good for China because China has over-inventory and China has over-capacity. China needs to sell steel, cement, many things elsewhere, number one. Number two, in the medium term, I think China needs energy security. That is very critical to China and indeed food security as well, but energy security is number one. And then in the long term, all those countries along the belt, the terrestrial belt, are basically Muslim countries. And China does have some internal issues with the Muslim community. For the most part, in, the, in all the provinces, there's no problem except one. And some people have mentioned that, and that is a Uyghur situation in, uh, in, in Xinjiang province. So China needs to make friends with all the Muslim countries west of China, all the way to eastern part of East Europe. Number two, 
Only when the terrestrial belt of Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, all the way uh, up to uh, uh, Georgia, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, <clears throat> uh, and Armenia, and so forth, unless there is economic development, they will not be able to trade with China. China need to help them first, together with any other country who want to participate in building the infrastructure that is necessary for those countries to economically develop. And finally, I suppose it's also good to make friends. After all, the United States every year in the United Nations in Geneva pick on China on its human rights record. I don't know why they don't pick on the Saudi Arabian, but anyway, they pick on the China and it's very useful to have more friends. My last comment is this, and I will open it, uh, and I will uh, turn to my three speaker, and that is, I believe that 100 years later, 200 years later, 500 years later, all the geopolitical, all the geoeconomic interactions may be accepted as, as is, or may be forgotten. But whatever it is, there is one thing I believe that is underlying the whole thing that will not be forgiven, no, not be forgotten, and that is the cultural exchange. Just like Silk Road of the old days, of course it accomplished something geoeconomically, a little bit geopolitically, but mainly the cultural exchange has perhaps affected the world more than anybody else. So I'm very, very honored to be here with the three very distinguished speakers. Immediately to my left, my good friend Mr. C.Y. Leung. He was the third chief executive of Hong Kong under the British. It's called governor, they, they, they govern us. It, it, now that after 1997, uh, the top leader of Hong Kong is called the chief executive, I suppose his business is very important to us. So Mr. Leung is the, first chief exec, uh, the third chief executive of Hong Kong after 1997, and after his term was up, he is now a vice chairman of CPPCC, or China Political, uh, People's Political Consultative Conference, which ranks him as one of the leaders of China. Sitting next to him is my other good friend, Shiv Kamka. Shiv's family is truly amazing. They hail from India. However, his parents are mostly in London, although every time I'm in London, his parents are traveling, can't see me. But anyway, uh, Shiv has lived, what, 20 years? Uh, 25. In 25 years in Russia. He speaks Russian fluently, many other languages as well. And then he is doing business all along the terrestrial belt. Of course, in India, which straddles both the belt and the sea road, but also Russia, and then he's, I understand, recently do, do, doing some business in China as well. So he is truly very qualified to speak on this subject. Last but not least, Dr. Bayou <coughs> Krishna Muti, the former Minister of Trade from Indonesia. As we all know, Indonesia is really the big country in Southeast Asia. They account for 40% of the population and 40% of the GDP of the entire <coughs> Indonesia, uh, of the entire ASEAN uh, countries. And Dr. Bayou is a leader in many, many fields, including agriculture, trade, and so forth. And so we are very, very happy, Dr. Bayou, that you can be with us. So I will begin by inviting Mr. Leung to perhaps being the a Chinese leader now, a national leader. Tell us something about the Belt and Road Initiative. What, is China, what does China have in mind? How can other countries participate? And then I will turn to Shiv and Dr. Bayou. Mr. Leung, floor is yours.